Good evening, everybody. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Chapter 12. We'll look at 9 through uh, 11. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honoring, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Lord, we thank you for everything, and we ask that you come down in a powerful way and meet with us as we uh, share your word, study your word, consider your word. May you be lifted up and glorified. May your word be anointed, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword that it can penetrate into our very being and expose what you want to expose to us. We just thank you that you are God and that you want to meet each of us in a personal way and we just say this in your name. Amen. This sermon may not be very long, which some of you will be glad so you don't melt in this house, but it's called Looking Forward. Now we've been considering God's great love, and we looked at it based on marriage last week, of honor, preferring, submission. The reality is that God's love must abound in our hearts, for what is not motivated by the love of God will fail to hit that mark of honoring and glorifying God. Now that's why the first great commandment is simply love God with everything in you, with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, whatever, as <laughs> so we get through this, but to love God with everything in you, period. And I think that's why in Revelation chapter 2, it begins with the church of Ephesus. And what was Ephesus' real problem? Well, it comes down to that they had religion, they had works, they had those different things, they stood for truth, but they left their first love. And I think this is a problem with a lot of different churches and people, is that, yeah, they may love God, but they have a divided heart, they've left their first love. And when you look at what Jesus said to them in Revelation 2, 5, I'm just going to go there really quickly as to what they need to do about their lack of love. He said, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, remember where you came from, go back to that first love that you had for Jesus, and repent. So you go back to where you started with the Lord, and you repent. Because guess what? You don't have that love, you don't have that zeal for him. It says, and do the first works or else. The first works of what? The first works you do out of love. We all, out of love for God, what he did to us, did things that we knew would be pleasing. We did things that we knew were right. And then he comes to this. And he says, I will come unto you quickly, or else I will come unto you quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now, we don't think too much of that. But what does it re mean to remove a candlestick? Well, you remove the life of that candlestick, which is the wick which connects it. And what's the life? It's Jesus. And you remove the what? The oil, which is the Holy Spirit. You take out those things that can get that can allow the candlestick to reach its potential. And it says, if you don't do that, I'm taking your candlestick out. Now, I'm not going to get in one save, always save all that other garbage. All I know is what the Bible warns me here. Don't leave your first love. If you do, repent, go back. Go back and repent of leaving your first love. Remember. Now, if our heart is not open... Our minds aren't being renewed. Our souls not being transformed. Guess what? 
we're not being tempered by the Holy Spirit, then the love of God will not be able to freely flow. You have to remember, we have to be open vessels for the love of God to flow through us and to others. We can't have these places where we're damned up with self, or we're boxed in by doctrine, or we're, uh, we're stuck in some kind of mud of my way of doing it, or whatever. You can't do that and be an open vessel and expect the love of God to be shed abroad in your heart. We have to be open vessels. We have to be complete and open. Now, love is an honorable commitment to do right before God and right to others. It's not some fickle emotion or silly, unrealistic fantasy. And that's how love is treated today in so many ways. Paul is very clear that love must be without hypocrisy. Wow, that's a tough one. It must be pure. And the only love that is pure is God's love. There is no other love. Even in mother and child, you see the mother become very possessive. Even in brotherly love, you can see someone become more dominant or more demanding in friendship. And the only pure love is God's love. It's that simple. Now, it will be appalled at evil because of what it does to others. It's not what evil does to you necessarily, but what it does to others. We are too, too quick to accept evil. And the reason we're quick to do that a lot of times is because evil is called good and good is called evil. Evil can have a beautiful side to it, but it is totally dark and wicked behind it. And sometimes it's hard to discern evil unless you know what you're looking for so you can identify it but usually down the line there's going to come an attitude out and then it's going to be followed by some kind of conduct that's contrary to the word of God and what you're going to see about evil wicked has practices but evil has agendas and those agendas are wicked and they're dark and they're usually of Satan so you have to keep that very clear. It will cleave to that which is good. It will cleave to that which is proves to be sweet to the soul and desirable to the spirit. And of course, bring glory to God. It will have fond affections towards others, not selfish, unrealistic expectations that will prove oppressive to both parties, whether jealousy or cruel tyranny. That's what you get. You either get this jealousy, you know, that's all consuming, or you get this cruel t tyranny of trying to control for your own benefit. And it's cruel, because it's totally indifferent to the other person. Now, it will display brotherly love by preferring one over another, by preferring someone over yourself. It will honor others above self prefer their well-being over personal preference of comfort and convenience along with desires. Godly love is about ensuring the well-being of the person and the health of relationships. Today, the relationships are so unhealthy. They're so perverted, one-sided, selfish. Uh, they're immoral, they're abominations, they're all kinds of things. They have just taken the whole concept of what God has established as sacred and they have just profaned it from one end to the next, whether it's marriage, friendships, anything. It's really a tragedy of the worst type. Many relationships are unhealthy and what you will find in unhealthy relationship is some kind of oppression. We love God by loving others. We honor God by honoring others, especially those who are weaker because we are showing grace. We're showing grace in that love. We have that great example of the cross. We were all weaker. And yet Christ went to the cross. 
He preferred us over himself. There was nothing comfortable or convenient about bearing the cross. We bring glory to God by having his same like sacrificial commitment to see the best for others, to see, desire to see them win, whether we like them or not. I always can tell I have the right attitudes about my enemies because I still want to see them win. I still, even though I may not appreciate them now here, I still want to spend eternity with them. And that's a real test. Now, it's not fleshy love I'm talking about, which is selfish and often driven by lust and wanes quickly. Our worldly love, which is, self, which is surface and conditional. It is God's love that, again, was displayed on the cross. So let's look at verse 11. It says, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. That's very simple. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. The thing that identifies godly love is its conduct. And people, there's nothing slothful in God's love. It's not slothful in what is needful. It reckons, recognizes needs. It meets needs when it can. It's not casual to respond to, towards responsibility when it comes to others. It is fervent to make sure it keeps its word, keeps its end, and does right. Now, we don't hear a lot about that. The reason is because all things that are being done is being done as, in the, as a point of service as unto the Lord. I want you to know, if you don't do things unto the Lord, it means nothing. You have to be honest about it, though. We say, oh, I'm doing this for the Lord, when in reality, we're doing it for ourselves. But, you know, it makes us look noble and honorable that we're doing it as unto the Lord. But the fruits and the taste of it eventually proves that we're not doing it as unto the Lord. Now, I've really had to go through my motives of why to do things. We have to be honest. We talked about that this morning in Bible study about being honest about our motives. Why we do what we, we do. If it's not for the glory of God, it's useless. It's vain. It's not going to be accepted in the end by God. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm sick of vain things. Now, a lot of things we do, I know it's all going to burn up and whatever, but I do it to be a good steward. I do it because this is God's sanctuary. But the reality is I'm still doing it as unto the Lord because I want him. I want, when people look here, I want them to see a testimony. And they do. They see a testimony here. And I want it to be honorable and I want it to bring glory to God. So that's why I do things the way I do things. People say, well, <laughs> You are, whatever. But anyway, I'm doing it because it's my best. And I'm offering it to God. So there can be some kind of testimony that comes out of it. Because people go by here, and I'm the only testimony they see is what we're out there doing. And what our yard or whatever it looks like. It may all seem silly, but it's unto the Lord. All service being done in God's love will bring glory to him. Remember, if your service doesn't ultimately bring glory to him, go back to whether you did it right or out of the right reason or not. It will bring glory to him. It will be pure, it will be pleasing, and it will be acceptable to him. Now, I want you to look at Ephesians 6 with me. Because it talks about service. I go to this a lot, and I think, oh, okay, here's, uh, here's some simple truths. Ephesians 6. I want you to look at this 
Ephesians 6, 5 through 7 with me. It says servants. People, we're all to be servants. We are born in the status of servants, actually slaves, and hopefully we become servants of God. It says, servants, be obedient to them that your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. So everything, whoever you're in subject to in this world, whether it's your boss or somebody else, you do it as unto the Lord. This is something that Carrie and I have talked a lot about, everything she does. It's not because of her bosses, it's because it's as unto the Lord. She'll keep it pure, she'll keep it sincere, and he can bless and honor that, whatever she does. It goes on to say, notice, singleness with fear, fear of the Lord, of displeasing him, trembling. You don't, you're not casual about what you're doing. In singleness of your heart, hearts are divided as unto the Lord. Then it goes, this is a big one, not with the eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Not just doing it because it's duty, not just doing it because uh, you do it from the heart. And if you don't have love, you can't do something from the heart. And then it goes on to say, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. It's always as unto the Lord and not to men. Period. So when I do something, I do it as unto the Lord. People say, well, when you get kicked or when they don't return it, what do you think? I say, it's none of my business. It was unto the Lord in the first place. It's between him and the other person. You see, when you do something that's to the Lord, it sets you free because you remove yourself out of the situation. And you let it be between God and that person. God knows the motive. God knows the reason. God knows it. It doesn't matter whether you get the recognition, you get this. You remove yourself out and you'll have freedom. If you don't, you're going to find yourself being pulled in, sucked into drama after drama. Whether this person looks at you right or not. Whether they treat you. Whether you get rewarded or not. Whether you get recognized. It is such a big, fat trap. It doesn't do you a bit of good. Because you know what? In the end, it will not matter what those men think. It comes down to what God thinks. And that's what matters in the end. As Christians, let's look at verse 12 now in, the, in Romans. It says, rejoicing in hope. Love this. Patient in tribulation, continually instant in prayer. This is a power. Each one is just loaded, each scripture. So let's take a look at the first one. It says rejoicing in what? Hope. As Christians, we have much to rejoice over. The main source of our rejoicing is the great hope we possess personally. As believers, our hope is not in this present world. I'll tell you, trying to get people to realize there's no hope in this present world, get over it. Our hope is not in this present world, but the next. You see, when people put their hope in this present world, it becomes deferred hope. Because the world can't really give you hope. It doesn't have the power, it doesn't have the source, it doesn't have the ability. So everybody that gets caught up on deferred hope is because they put their hope in, in, in something other than God and his word. And so their hope is deferred. So what happens to a person when they have deferred hope? Well, they end up with a wounded spirit a lot of times. Despair, depression, 
they're despondent. I mean, we could go on and on because it takes everything out of them because they put their hope in the wrong thing. So people end up with deferred hope constantly. I remember as a kid, my parents would promise me a certain thing. I put my hope in that promise. Oh, I put my hope. And then something came up and I was let down. And everything went out at me. <laughs> my parents didn't keep their promise. That is the way it is. And that's the way the world is. The world cannot give you hope because it can't keep any of its promises which are false or temporary or elusive. We don't, we're not taught that, but we need to understand that. As believers, we have great hope because the promises we are heirs to are, is, are great. Those promises are eternal, though. They're not of this world. They're of the next. I want them now. No, they're not for now. They're for eternal existence, not for a temporary one. Yes, we will experience certain aspects of those promises. Salvation. Okay, we will have blessings. But all those blessings are temporary con con compared to what we have eternally. And yet, oh, I want the promises now. No. The promises are not for now. They're to be inherited by faith. And you can't be slothful about that if you're going to inherit things by faith. Hope in the world basically points to promises made that are temporary and often elusive and will always be broken. There is no expectation attached to this world there is no real hope, and yet how many people grab the branches of the world to only find that they easily break, leaving them in despair? These people often become angry. I've met them. I've talked to them. They become angry. Oh, if my fantasy didn't come through. Oh, oh, oh I didn't get this. You know what? Their expectation, of course, was attached to the world, but they become angry. And you know who they become angry at? Not the world, but God. They're mad at God. You see, people see God as a sugar daddy. <laughs> He's serving their whims. Not as God, right? Or they see him as a Santa Claus, giving them all their desires. I'm here to say he's neither. He is God. He's not here to serve you. He's here to be served by you. He's your creator. You're the vessel. We seem to need to be brought down to that understanding. He is holy, people. He is holy. He doesn't bow down to flesh. He doesn't pay attention to the world. He's holy. He's unique. He alone is God. He alone deserves your worship, your service, your devotion. He alone. There must never be competition, divided hearts, man competing with God in people's lives. It doesn't work. You'll lose. Big time. When I was married, my ex-husband felt like he was competing with my time, my energy, my strength, because he wanted to be the sole focus of my world. There's no way you can be that. But what he didn't realize is he was in competition with God, and he lost. Who did he get mad at? Well, he got mad at me. But basically, he became an angry man over that. Because he had deferred hope. His expectation was in me. 
not in God. Man will fail man all the time. Remember what we're told about hope in Romans 5. Just go back to Romans 5 with me. We've read this before. We studied it. It says a lot, but when Paul mentions this, you sort of need to go back. We're going to look at 1 through 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice. There's that. Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Notice what it says. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. We have much to rejoice in. We have what? We've been justified by faith into his grace. We stand in hope. We stand by faith while rejoice in the hope of glory that's awaiting us. Not the glory that we wish we had now, but the glory that awaits us. How many are so caught up with the world that they think they deserve or want to experience or taste of it? That God is only considered when they're in trouble or in a mess. Oh, let me have enough of the world. But when I get in trouble, I'll run to you. Get me out of that mess. Get me out of that trouble. Our bargain with you, God. Just let me have this and then I'll serve you. Just let me do this and then I'll serve you. Oh, how man bargains with a holy God. How man takes back his words and, uh, and in conveniently forgets. God doesn't, though. Yes, people, we have to endure this present world. We do. That is why we look forward. I don't serve God based on my, what I see in this world. I serve God based on what I know the next world has for me. I'm always looking forward, like Abraham, to the city made by the hands of God. You always look forward. You always, because people, if you're not looking forward, you're not going to be walking forward. If you look back, you're not going to walk forward. If you look around, you're going to stumble. If you look to the side, you're going to miss it. And so you've got to look forward in light of glory. His glory, not the glory that this world offers or that you think some position is going to offer you, but His glory. That's what you look forward to. You see, that's why we can endure, because our life, our hope, our promises are not of this world. That is why our expectation of what's yet to come is so glorious. We have a glorious expectation. Our victory, though, lies in waiting. Oh, we have to wait. Patient in tribulation. That's your process. That's your fine-tuning that's going on. That's where God's trying to temper you. So you learn to wait. But when the time comes, you're prepared to go. You learn to wait. Because when you learn to wait, you know what else you learn to do? You learn to rest in his promises. A lot of people aren't waiting. They're impatient because they have not learned to rest in his promises. They want them now, not down the line, when they can experience the glory behind it. See the glory behind it. See the results of it. They're not interested in down the line. They're interested in only now. You talk about so short vision, they perish because of it. This is why we learn to wait. Because in light of that, in light of what awaits us, we can have the necessary patience that will allow us to experience the hope that gives us great expectation towards what is awaiting us. 
Our victory lies in waiting. Uh. But what does it lie in waiting in, in regards to prayer? That's what it's talking about. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Instant, continuing instant in prayer. Do you have to add that one? You know, the rest is pretty hard, but that one, instant in prayer, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually instant in prayer. That's hard. You mean I have to be instant in prayer no matter what? Yes, you do. Whatever circumstances you are, you have to be instant in prayer to go to God about it, to talk to God about it, to ask God about it. You know, a lot of people have this prayer life they have cut out for them. I really don't. If you uh, talk to someone like Carrie, she is a real prayer. I mean, she's a prayer. And, and the things that God answers shock, sometimes shocks me. They're so simple. And the way he answers it, I think, oh, yeah, that's childlike prayer and faith and trust. And, I mean, she comes and says, you know what he did for me today? And she said, I've been praying about that. I think, oh, really? She prays about every small thing. I forget half the small things I should pray about, they think, half the time. It's a joy. But for me, instant prayer is different. Because I'm going along and God speaks to me with his word. Or he shows me things. Maybe I asked him yesterday about it. I'm walking along, and he shows me when I least expect it. He's speaking to me. I sometimes meditate on something. I think about meditate. I say, Lord, sometimes I wonder about that, you know. And I'll be walking along, and I'll be doing something, and all of a sudden a revelation will come to me, and he will answer that. You see, prayer is different for different people. The key about prayer is the heart of prayer. Always open to speak to God, to seek God, to listen to God, to have that open communication to God at all times. So if he needs to speak to you about somebody who needs you to pray for them or minister to them, you hear him, you obey him. Where the Spirit can lead you, or the Spirit can instruct you, or the Spirit can show you things. So you find yourself always in season, ready for anything. Where your ministry can be proven, because you've learned to communicate with God. To be constant in that communication. He communicates differently to all of us. And we communicate with him differently because I see him in his word. I hear him in his word. I ask questions about his word and he answers that. We have to be continually instant in prayer. Some people have just tremendous prayer clauses where the presence of God meets them immediately when they walk into them. I don't have that. But what I have is precious. And it's still between God and me. You have to be continually instant in prayer. Prayer requires you to wait sometimes. To wait for answers. Now, that's not easy. It's not easy. You see, hope is the springboard of expectation. It is sure and steady because our hope is founded in the rock. However, faith is that which takes flight in the current of expectation in light of the many great promises. And it especially does when prayer, which is considered the incense that goes up to heaven, begins to rise up out of a sincere heart with childlike confidence that God is going to meet me 
and he's going to answer that prayer according to his will. We can rejoice, people, because he hears and will answer, will answer our prayers according to his perfect will, his many graces, and in line with his plan. Now, I could go on about prayer because the Bible's full of it. People approaching God in prayer. But you know what? It's a good thing to end with. Because each one of us have our own prayer life. We have our own way of approaching God, of hearing from God. Some pray about small things because their faith is built up by those small things. Some are open to be moved wherever because they're ready for ministry full time. Some know how to stand in a gap like never before as great intercessors. Some know how to take on Satan in their prayers. We all have different places in our prayer life. That's why when we talk about prayer, it talks about it being incense, being offered up to God. It varies, but it's beautiful. It's different, but it's, it's so something that pleases God because that prayer is about communicating with God. It's about learning to walk with God, talk with God, listen for God. Be ready to hear what he wants to say to you when he intrudes into your world. That takes practice. It takes patience. It takes exercising your faith in prayer. It takes a lot of different things. And that's what it's talking about here. We can talk about prayer all night. But, you know, we have to, as I sometimes said, we must wait in patience to experience the hope, to know the promises, to know the answers to prayer. There is rejoicing in the revelation of Christ. There's rejoicing in who he is in times of tribulation. There's rejoicing in his light when prayers are answered. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice because of the great hope we have. For Paul and Dee summarize the essence of our hope in Colossians 1.27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what it's all about. Gaining, possessing Christ. And the more you gain, the more you possess, the more you will rejoice and look forward to what awaits you in the glory yet to come. <laughs>